So before the actual video starts, as a quick warning, there is no physically possible way I'm gonna be able to talk about Torn of the Golden Country without spoiling something from the base game. So if you're the type that cares about spoilers and haven't played the base game first, I would recommend doing that before watching this video. To those of you who don't care about spoilers or have played the base game already, welcome, it's good to have you here. Despite all of the controversies, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 was for me and many others a great game with a lot of great things going for it. The story was, of course, one of those things, but aspects of the story like Jin's past with Laura, what exactly happened with Mithra to make her hate herself, and why the country of Torna sank in the first place were all questions I can imagine a lot of people asked after beating the game. Seven months after the release of 2, though, it was announced at Nintendo's E3 presentation that the game would get an expansion pass, which would feature a lot of new things, like quests and blades, but more importantly, it would feature what is probably the best thing to ever be included in any expansion pass, Torna the Golden Country, an entirely new game meant to expand further on the Aegis War. Interestingly enough, Torna the Golden Country was actually supposed to be a chapter in the original game, with it taking place between chapters 7 and 8, but it was cut because it would have taken too much time away from the main cast with it getting so big. And to be honest, I'm kind of glad it was, because frankly, this is mechanically one of the most fun RPGs I've ever played, and if it was its own chapter, I likely wouldn't have been able to experience this. So, on behalf of the entirety of the Xenoblade fandom, thank you Monolith Soft for your ambition with your games. For real though, Torn of the Golden Country does a lot for the story and characters of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and it also makes for an even more fun experience with how it improves some of the basic mechanics of the base game while also doing its own very unique thing. So let's check out the story of the Aegis War and see exactly how the war with Malos went 500... Uh, you know what? Who am I kidding here? You heard the spoiler warning at the beginning of this video. At least half of the people watching this right now knows exactly how this story ends. Sure, you may not know the exact details, but most of you here know that Mithra is going to somehow end up sinking Torna harder than that iceberg sank the Titanic. There's no chance any of this goes well for anyone involved with the exception of this douchebag. Ugh, let's get started, I guess. Taking place 500 years before the events of the main game, Torn of the Golden Country opens with Malos, sinking the country of Sia with his own black version of Mithra's Siren. You'll want to keep this in mind for later, partly because this scene pretty much sets the tone for the whole game. Yeah, Torna is a game that very much assumes you've played the main game first, because it reveals a few very important things early on, like how Malos is an Aegis who's bent on the destruction of mankind, and more importantly, Laura and her blade, Jin. Laura and Jin serve as the protagonists for this game, allowing us to learn more about Jin's relationship with Laura and why this would cause him to take the path he does 500 years later. And to be honest, they're kind of adorable together. Laura's a bigger dork than I ever expected, and I love it. She contrasts very well with Jin's more stoic personality, and I think they really complement each other. One of my favorite scenes in the game is still that moment where they continue Jin and Laura's conversation in his old house, where after delivering his line of, I am who I am, I don't change. Laura messes with him by doubling over from how cool she thought he was. This entire scene is just precious, in my opinion. In regards to Jin, though, if you watched the spoiler section of my video on the main game, you might remember how I said his character confuses me a bit. Yeah, this entire game is why he confuses me at all. You see, I don't really understand why he would team up with Malos in the end, when Malos is kind of in an indirect sort of way, the entire reason why Laura died in the first place. Sure, Amalthus is definitely more to blame, given that he is more directly responsible than Malos for that entire situation, but would there not be some lingering resentment there? And I get that Jin isn't exactly the biggest fan of humanity himself, the game makes this clear, but he never seemed too fond of Malos and Torna, so it seems weird to me that he would willingly team up with this guy. And yes, I know that Jin didn't really know what to do with his life after he lost Laura, and subsequently Hayes as well, but of all the people he could have followed, it just seems weird to me he'd willingly pick Malos of all people. It's possible there's an aspect of his relationship with Malos I'm just missing, though. So, to anyone watching this who understands this better than I do, please let me know in the comments, because this has left me a bit confused for a while. Then we have Mithra and Adam, who have a far more different relationship than I was expecting. Some of the scenes in Base 2 left me thinking that Mithra and Adam were either nice friends or maybe she had a crush on him, since Rex does remind Azerta and Pyra of him, but they seem to have more of a father-daughter relationship. Mithra starts off the adventure as a sort of arrogant bratty teen, and thanks to Adam's 
the whale lectures, I guess you could call them, and the people around her, Mithra slowly grows to be a more compassionate person who manages to temper that ego of hers. That being said, for as good of an influence on Mithra Adam was, he wasn't exactly perfect with her. Like Adam said in the base game, he was scared of Mithra's power, and after the first few hours, it became clear how those seeds of fear regarding her power got planted in Mithra's mind in the first place. Honestly, it was kind of surreal seeing Mithra so willing to use Siren in the early parts of Torna, because that's 100% not something she would do in the present. I will give Adam this one, though. I love how big of a softie this guy is. It's kind of charming, to be honest. Here's to hoping his wife made it out, too. He would make for a great dad. And it's just a shame we have no possible evidence to suggest that she made it out okay at all, though. In regards to Amalthus this time around, I just have to say that I frankly hated this man's guts even more after playing this. This man literally murdered his way to the top to become Praetor, just so that he could kill the surviving Tornans in a vain attempt at killing Adam so that he could get Mithra out of the picture. Once I had complete context for the Aegis War and what Amalthus did, it also gave me full context for Malos and why I genuinely feel sorry for this guy. I mean, yes, he did kill presumably tens of thousands of people, but you gotta remember, his entire personality and outlook on humanity exists because of Dark Elf Murder Pope over here. Malos, for as much as he revels in being a villain this time around, is only like this for reasons out of his control. If Amalthus had picked Mithra's crystal instead, we'd have a very different story, and Malos would be a way better person. Mithra, though, well, at least she wouldn't have PTSD. Chronicles 2, for as much as I loved it with all of my heart, was not a perfect game. Its tutorials were terrible, the blade system, while fun, wasn't exactly perfect, and do I even need to explain the problem with field skills? The guys over at Monolith, though, paid attention to the criticism for it, and with Torna, they either improved or perfected a lot of things Stu did, good or bad. First off, they actually fixed the tutorials this time around. They're just better overall, and you can actually review them this time around in the tips menu. Why this wasn't patched into the base game, though, I'll never understand. They also added in a nice little quality of life improvement involving collection points, where they'll show you what you can expect to get from it and how rare the collectibles you get from it are, which is a lovely little touch. I would have also appreciated this being patched in, but I can easily see that putting this in might be a little more time consuming than the tips menu. Field skills are also improved this time around, with you never really needing high amounts of anything to progress the story, and having every field skill you'll ever need on all six of the party's blades, meaning you'll never need to fumble around menus to change around your team. Pouch items, unlike in the base game, aren't bought. They're instead crafted at campsites by the various members of the party, with Laura specializing in charms, Hayes with talismans, Jin with his home cooking, Bridget with her perfumes, Aegean with his gourmet cooking, Minoth with his plays, and Mithra with what can be very loosely described as food. Oh sweet Klaus, they needed to censor it. Adam and Hugo, though, make special key items that give various small buffs to the party, similarly to the shop contracts from base 2. These will typically require a variety of items, but none of them were really annoying to make at all. What is easily the biggest change Torna made, though, was its combat, because it's a very different beast from its counterpart. Instead of having the driver do all the fighting with the exception of special attacks, blades and drivers fight separately with their own weapons. This was way before Laura's accidental new fighting style caught on, meaning every member of the party has their own unique arts to use in combat, with either the driver or one of their blades serving as your rear guard. A small detail I like is that for the blades, all of their vanguard arts are their levels 1 through 3 special attacks from the normal game. It's a little detail I know, but it's a nice one. As mentioned before, anyone currently active in your rearguard will operate as backup with their own rearguard arts that will either buff the vanguard or attack the enemy infrequently. Switching in activates a character's switch art, which always has a driver combo as their effect, encouraging the player to be switching vanguard slots mid-combat often. Further encouraging this is Torna's rework of the chain attack system. Instead of having to finish a blade combo route, or even following one at all, you can use any element special at all so long as each one is a level higher than the last one. And instead of only getting one elemental orb at the end of each stage of the blade combo, you get an orb of that element for each stage of the blade combo, and even if you don't finish the combo in time, you keep any orbs that were added. This makes chain attacks consistently last longer, and it makes getting a full burst actually feasible in this game. Seriously, how often did you actually get a full burst in the base game? Like, once or not at all? And on a completely unrelated note, the Torna battle theme is freaking amazing, and is one of the best battle themes I've ever heard. I really wish I was better at talking about music, because the soundtracks for these games are spectacular, easily some of the best music I've ever heard in an RPG, and I do not do these things justice. 
Honestly though, the reworks to the chain attacks and gameplay makes combat in Torna incredibly fast paced and some of the most fun I've ever had in an RPG. Getting a ton of elemental orbs on a monster to overkill them in a full burst is incredibly satisfying and helps make Torna on a mechanical level my favorite entry in the series to play. That being said though, while I did mention last video about how I had nothing but praise for Torna, this wasn't actually true though, cause it does have one big community sized problem. For as much credit as I give Monolith for their ambition, it's abundantly clear to me that Torn of the Golden Country may have needed a bigger scope. Torna has a big problem with padding. It's some of the most fun padding I've ever played through, but no matter how much of it is solid gold, padding is still padding. There are a few moments in the story that we'll see you doing things kinda unrelated to whatever's going on, like how the group investigates what might have been a Malos attack, only for it to be a big ol' lizard with fire breath. Then there's that one moment in Aletta where before heading off to Hyber Village, the group gathers materials for medicine in the event they contract an illness you can only get in the Danog Desert. Does this play into anything? No, nobody gets so much as the sniffles, so I have to wonder why this part was even included in the game at all. The biggest and worst offender of this is the game's community system. When you complete quests, you'll gain one or more NPCs involved with it as an ally, and after you gain a certain amount, your community will level up. The only purpose this serves is to act as a narrative roadblock after certain points in the story. The first being after you meet up with the Tornin King where you need to be at level 2 for Malos to attack the city with his gargoyles, and the second being after Laura's Knighting where instead of a small jump of one level, it's two and you need to be at level 4 in order for Malos to awaken the Tornin Titan. Is Malos under some kind of contract or just weirdly polite? Like, he could awaken the Tornin Titan at literally any point he wants to and he instead decides to wait until the player has helped find some armu for some kid? Maybe he just wants to crush them when their spirits are at their highest. He's sadistic enough for that, right? I will say though, even if the padding is really bad, I still love doing all the side quests every time I play through this game. They can be done fairly quick and have some really nice little stories in them, and seeing the community uh, sphere fill up more is weirdly satisfying for me. My favorite side quest is probably the Tornin Cook-Off. It's a simple quest, but it's nice seeing the crew just have some fun, and Mithra's pride in her, uh, that is weirdly endearing for me. Side note, does anyone else feel the fight with the mercenaries in the Rare Sense of Justice quest goes on a little too long? Like, guys, I've beaten up 12 of your dudes in the span of 5 minutes with no scratches on me. Are none of you realizing you're not winning this fight? Also, I do have to say that on a narrative level, the side quests do serve a pretty important purpose at least. You're doing all of these quests and getting to know the people of Torna, all while helping to make a slightly better tomorrow for others. But deep down, you know the truth. That being that in the end, it won't matter because at least half of these people will die by the end of the adventure and there is nothing you or I can do to save them. You know, I find it ironic that we started this marathon with the theme of seizing your own destiny and changing the future if you don't like the outcome. And now in a way, we're ending off with the exact opposite thing happening. We the player have foreseen a devastating future but no matter how many people you help, how strong you make the main characters, no matter how many ways you can think of to avoid the outcome, you are powerless to change it. Everything in the game leads up to the moment at the Torn and Core where everyone fights Malos and what is my favorite final boss in the series. Like seriously, having the artifices be their own one-off surprise mechanic was super cool. And thanks to how much health he has, I was able to get two separate full bursts off in that battle. It's such a good fight. Also, was anyone else hella disappointed Ophian showed up to fight the gargoyles only to be shot down like five seconds later? Seriously, how is he less durable than Siren? It's a giant mechanical sea serpent. <clears throat> uh, anyways though, this is the part of the story most people playing this game for the first time are dreading because they know exactly what's coming next. The sinking of Torna and how Mithra caused it. After the final fight with Malos, he uses his siren to shoot a blast at the capital city of Oresco, the same city that Adam and Mithra left Milton and tiny Mikhail in to keep them safe. This causes Mithra to have an emotional breakdown, and because of the problems Adam and Mithra have with their relationship, when she channels the power of Ion and her true power of Numa, Adam is left unable to fully utilize Mithra's powers, and she resorts to using her artifice to fight off Malos. In the process though, her laser damages the Torn and Titan, and after she channels Ion's true power through Siren, she accidentally kills it. This is it. This is the moment alluded to many times in the base game. 
There is no misunderstanding involved or anything like that. Accident or not, Mithra is 100% responsible for the Titan's death, and realistically, also killed an unknown number of innocent people. Both this and her seeing Milton's dead body ultimately result in the creation of Pyra, and what's interesting about this is that Mithra says she constructed Pyra, and the way she says this makes it seem like this was a planned course of action. This scene reveals that it was the exact opposite. Mithra was so broken after the events of Torna that in order to cope, her mind created an advanced version of DID by making Pyra, a separate entity that in Mithra's own mind is a better version of her. She's less abrasive, she can cook better, she's much better at socializing with others, she's everything Mithra thinks she should be, even if she doesn't know these are all things she's capable of herself. This whole thing makes me appreciate the ending for two more, since Pyra and Mithra being separate people now means that Mithra, while probably still in need of therapy, doesn't need Pyra to be a mental shield for her, and Pyra can truly be her own person. Now, do you remember that part at the beginning where I mentioned how Malos killing Sia was important? If you've played the base game, did you ever pick up on how Pyra never corrected anyone when they said the Aegis, Pyra and Mithra in this context, sank three continents when they only ever sunk Torna? Heck, I don't even think they would be aware of Spacia having sunk based on what little we know of the timing of it, to be honest. My thinking is that the ending of the Aegis War left Mithra and subsequently Pyra so mentally scarred and depressed that at the mention of them having sunk more titans than they actually did, there's a part of them that convinces them that it was somehow still their fault. After all, when you're depressed, it doesn't matter how many lies the negative part of you tells yourself. So long as there's even a slight ounce of truth to any of it, you'll believe it. And for Pyramithra, they've seemingly convinced themselves that the burden of what was lost should fall on their shoulders and theirs alone. And the knowledge that this, this exact thing, is the mindset they've had stewing in their head for the last 500 years while they've been sleeping makes the entire ending of this game really hurt. Jin and Laura don't exactly help though, since if Adam had never asked them to go to Spacia, Laura might still be alive, and Jin would never have walked down the path he did, and Hayes would never have fallen into the hands of this guy. Ugh, seriously, Hayes's line before the final fight with Malos is the devs basically teasing us at that point. Not cool, guys. Every time I play through this, I'm always left with a hollow feeling at the end. Like, I know there's a good ending for a few of these guys 500 years later, but that's just the thing, isn't it? The only one here who gets a good ending as far as we know is Pyra and Mithra, Minoth, possibly Adam, and technically Aegean and Brigid, though I don't know how much you want to count them. Torna, for as sad and heartbreaking as its story is, gives me an even greater appreciation for the entire story of 2, and is part of the reason why 2, tied with Torna, is one of my favorite games ever made, and why Pyra and Mithra are my favorite female characters in gaming. Honestly, it's kinda surreal that I'm actually done with this marathon. This whole thing initially started as just a new thing to try out for the channel, with me wanting to start doing marathons, and after the announcement of 3, it only encouraged me to try harder, only for this series to be delayed by 3 months thanks to a slightly high-tech potato of a computer going bad on me. Now, four and a half months later, I've found a new format for my videos that I really love, and these reviews have become some of the best performing things on my channel at the moment. But I couldn't be more excited to make the video for Xenoblade Chronicles 3, since it's shaping up to be even better than 2 for me, which would be absolutely wonderful, even if it's only on a mechanical level. That being said, though, I'm actually not sure what to do for the next video. I didn't actually expect to get done this fast. The next review marathon will probably be on one of these series, but that doesn't exactly help me in the meantime. I'll tell you what though, I'll get that figured out myself, but in the meantime, thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a nice day.